Hello and greetings. Welcome to another lesson from the Venice Church of Christ. We're disciples making disciples in Los Angeles. I'm Ethan Longhenner and I'm very glad that you've joined us today. Thank you for spending some time and giving us the gift of that time as we continue to explore what God has made known regarding Jesus in Scripture. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus made it known to his disciples that he was going to be betrayed, he was going to be uh, caused to suffer, and he was going to be crucified at the hands of the elders and chief priests in Jerusalem. And his disciples could not understand what he was saying. They couldn't envision how that could possibly be. How could Jesus die? He was the one they just confessed to be the Messiah, the Holy One of God in Luke 9 and verse 20. They were going to soon see him enter Jerusalem in triumph in chapter 19. And surely he would now take on his role as the son of David, as that king and would defeat the Romans and set up the glorious kingdom that God had promised through the prophets. And yet, as all four gospel authors attest, Jesus went to Jerusalem and a week later was betrayed, condemned, and executed as a common criminal, just like he had said. How was that even possible? Wasn't Jesus the Son of God? Wasn't he the Word of God made flesh? Did he not commit a sin? He was sinless, right? No deceit was found in his mouth, according to Hebrews 4.15 and 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. If he is God, and if he did nothing wrong, how could he have been killed? How could that have been appropriate in any way? How could that lead to anything that could be good? And why would Jesus go and do so knowing he was going to be killed and that he presumed that it was God's plan all along. And in this way, really what we're asking is, why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus have to die? And we're given him hints about that question within the Gospels themselves. In John chapter 1, the very beginning of the Gospel, John the Baptist saw Jesus to coming toward him and declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Matthew 20 and verse 28, Jesus himself, when he's talking to his disciples, trying to under, help them understand that trying to figure out who's going to be greatest in the kingdom is a fool's errand. That the one who is great in the kingdom is going to be your servant. The greatest will be your slave, which is a complete contradiction in terms. And he says that even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, okay, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what does Jesus mean when he says he's the Lamb of God? What does it mean when he is going to give his life ransom for many? To understand the image of the Lamb, we need to understand something about how animal sacrifices worked under the law. In Exodus chapter 12, we see in the Passover observance, where a lamb was to be killed, his blood was to be put upon the lintel, so that the angel would pass over the houses of the Israelites as he was going about uh, destroying the firstborn of Egypt. In Leviticus 5, we see provisions made about sin offerings, which can include a lamb, although normally uh, was really bulls or goats. And so it's the, the Passover symbolism here about the lamb, uh, the means of liberation, deliverance for the people of God. And also the uh, atonement for sin. And that's what's going on with the whole reason for sacrificing, which seems very strange and bizarre to us uh, that we've been separated from it uh, for so long. Uh, in Leviticus 17 and verse 11, the author there establishes that the life of an animal or life of a creature is in the blood. And so the blood is shed and it's about blood because it's really about the life that is in that blood. And it's giving of a life. And so the idea is if there is a guilty life, the guilty life ought to pay the punishment. But if an innocent life is given for that guilty life, it can atone or cover for that guilty life. The sins of the person who had sinned could be in a way applied to or put upon the animal so that that sin would no longer be held against the person who was offering that animal. So the lamb dies so that the sinner can be cleansed and to live. And in this way, it can be reckoned that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that he could take upon himself the sin to provide cleansing for those who would trust in him. 
the idea of ransom shows that this this illustration you know we reach it in many different ways it, yes we have this the functional the, the the center of the symbolism of Jesus' death and it's a very real death but how we understand it is through all of these illustrations and so the one illustration is the one of sacrifice which we understand uh, from the animal sacrifices and can see uh, in Hebrews and many other places but even in Hebrews and other places we have also the idea of ransom or debt to pay a ransom is to pay a fine to pay a, to pay money and so to give his life a ransom for many he is offering his life for other lives so that others could be paid for and so we see that as another way of looking at it as in terms of payment not just in terms of offering a sacrifice and and there's a reminder to us in humility that there's many different ways we can approach understanding Jesus' death and we should not prioritize or privilege one as if that is the only way that we use to understand why Jesus died but it gets to the question, why did Jesus have to pay that ransom? Why did he have to be the Lamb of God and to take on the sin of the world? What is that sin of the world that John brings up anyway? Well, it's that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, according to Romans 3 and verse 20. Why did the Israelites need to offer those animals? Yes, some were offered as thank offerings, some were offered uh, for other things, but the, the, the thrust of that whole sacrificial system was to atone for sin, that the Israelites had committed sins uh, against God and needed that forgiveness. And that sin problem, uh, according to uh, Romans 5, goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered into the creation. And that day they died a spiritual death and there was no recourse for it. Uh, they had sinned, they were now a subject to death and there was nothing they could do about it. And ever since, uh, we've all <clears throat> fallen prey to that, that we have the ancestral in, uh, ancestral. Uh, difficulty with sin from Adam and Eve, that we all are under the sentence of death, that all of us will die unless the Lord returns one uh, while we're still uh, in the body. Uh, all of us uh, turn to sin eventually. We all, in the fear of death, turn to the powers, principalities, and, 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 and serve them in some way, uh, shape, or form. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory after all. And that's why sin is such a bad thing. A lot of people today want to knock the idea of sin. It's just say that it's just kind of what religious people say to make you feel guilty about doing the things that you want to do. But sin is very much a problem, very much a difficulty. It separates us from our Creator, who is a source of light and life and all that is good, according to Isaiah 59, uh, 1 and 2. It's an affront to His majesty and His glory and His honor, and it is unhealthy. It is not good for us. Uh, we want to think that sin is fun and enjoyable, but it isn't. And a lot of times it comes at the expense of other people. And it harms, degrades, explo exploits, and oppresses others. And those who have committed sin obtain the penalty of death because it is separation from God who is a source of light and life and therefore alienation from Him. And if we die while separated from God, we have no hope of salvation, but unfortunately uh, look forward to the, the terror of, of being in, in torment forever in Romans 6, 23, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. And so sin leads to our ruin and condemnation. And so it's a big problem. And as human beings, when we come across a problem like sin, we want to find a way of solving it, right? We want to fix our problems. And so we're looking for what's the fix to our sin problem? And the gospel is very clear about this. Jesus and the apostles make it clear that we cannot solve this problem on our own. That if we could solve the problem on our own, there would be some kind of recourse. But the problem is, is that once we've transgressed, we're just transgressors. So many of us in the world want to look at our sin in terms of good and evil. And we think that, well, our good deeds will outweigh our evil deeds and therefore we're going to get a pass. But that's not the way that it works. We may want it to be the way that it works, but that's not the way that it works. The way that it works is much more in a judicial way. Uh, James makes this very clear, and as does Paul, that when you have sinned, you are now a transgressor because the law is there to tell you, do this, don't do that. All it can do is tell you, do this or don't do that. If you don't do what you should do and you do what you shouldn't do, it just tells you, you've broken it. You've transgressed. Now you're a transgressor. Uh, James puts it in terms of, we can look at it uh, very easily from James 2, 9 through 11, in terms of a court case. Imagine that you are on trial because uh, you have stolen something. And your defense lawyer stands up and says, people, the jury, um, 
My client stole, absolutely, but my client didn't commit adultery, they didn't murder, uh, they help old ladies cross the street and give to the poor and all these other things. Well, it's not going to make a difference, right? And you need a better defense lawyer because you're on trial for stealing. And if you admit that you have stolen, then you are guilty. It doesn't matter all the other laws you haven't transgressed. It doesn't matter all the good that you have done. Now, that all might be taken into account in the sentencing phase, but it doesn't change the fact that you are guilty. And that's the way it works with sin. When we have sin, we are now guilty. And what is this penalty for sin? It's death. It's separation and alienation from God. And... So, uh, there's nothing that we can do on our own to save ourselves. What about all those animal sacrifices then? Uh, well, they were all, all uh, commanded by God in Leviticus and other passages. Uh, but as the Hebrews author says, the blood of bulls and goats cannot really take away sin. Because they cannot perfect the conscience of the one offering them. Uh, because there will need to be constant, another animal will need to be offered, right? There, there's never an end to that. And so that's just not sufficient. It's not enough. We can't presume to stand before God uh, to be justified by how we've lived, our works, our deeds, or because we slaughtered a lot of animals. And we need to be honest with ourselves that God would be completely in the right to see, well, wow, these people have all really messed it up. I'm just going to wash my hands of them and be done with them. He would have been completely in the right to leave us out on our own with no hope in the world. But thanks be to God that he is a God of justice. And there will be justice for the ones who have, done, have suffered wrong. And his judgment will not be idle. But he is also a God of love and mercy and covenant loyalty. We say in Deuteronomy 32, 4, Isaiah 30, and verse 8, 1 John 4, 9, and many other passages. And that is why Jesus was sent as the Lamb of God, as the ransom, to allow us to be forgiven of our sins because we couldn't do it ourselves. He did it for us. His blood could atone because he lived sinlessly and therefore uh, did accomplish the law, and therefore could uh, perfect those who would put their trust in him. That's why he's a lamb of God. He's sinless. He is pure. He is clean. He is holy. And he is a conscious and willing sacrifice. And as the Hebrews often makes it clear in Hebrews 9, 24 through 26, he doesn't have to continually offer himself all the time. He offered himself once for all. The one sacrifice he made was sufficient. Paul in Romans 5 will appeal back to the fact that Adam and Eve sinned one sin, that brought sin into the world. Thus, through the one act of righteousness that Jesus has on the cross, he can atone or cover for the sins of the world. And that's a very important corollary there, because Jesus doesn't have to keep offering himself. His one offering was sufficient to atone for any and all sin. He has died to death, and now he lives to no longer die again, as Paul makes clear in Romans chapter 6. And as a corollary to that, as Paul will try to make clear in 1 Timothy chapter 1, because he died once for all, there is no sin so egregious as to be beyond the ability to be forgiven. And he says, and he puts himself forward, look, I blaspheme. I was complicit in the murder of Christians. And yet I was called so that in me God would show his great mercy. Uh, I am the chiefest of sinners, yet I can find forgiveness in Christ. That means that whoever you are, whatever you've done, you are not beyond redemption in Jesus. You can have your sins covered by the blood of Jesus if you would repent and turn to him and put your trust in him. And through that death and the life that God gives him afterward, Jesus is able to inaugurate the new covenant. In Hebrews 8 and 9, the Hebrews author makes much of this. Going back to Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah promised there's going to be this new covenant where God was going to forgive their sins and never remember their iniquities anymore. And the Hebrews author sees in that, that with the constant sacrifice, there's a constant reminder of sin. Because you constantly are needing to re-offer animals. It's a constant memory that you've continually sinned. And yet Jesus now can be the one who, as the priest in the Oracle of Melchizedek, come in and offering himself, and that one offering is now sufficient for all time. That inaugurates this new covenant, brings in the opportunity uh, to uh, revitalize uh, and to complete and make better all that had come before, uh, just what Jeremiah was looking forward to. And of course, he is that mediator between God and man in 1 Timothy 2.5, because he is both God and man, has suffered like us, yet without sin. And in so doing, Jesus is able to kill the hostility that exists among mankind. And in Ephesians 2, 11 through 18, Paul makes much of this, that Jesus in his death kills the hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles because it takes out of the way that, that law that separated them. 
and the standards that separated them. And in fact, it's Jesus' death that allows Paul to say that in Jesus there is neither male nor female, nor Jew nor Greek, nor free nor slave, nor Scythian nor barbarian. barbarian. We're all all in all, because anything that would divide us in the world is of lesser standing than what joins us in Christ. That all these worldly divisions are done away with because all are invited. From the one sacrifice Jesus made for all sin to receive cleansing and to become a new man in Jesus and to participate in Jesus' kingdom. And this is how Paul is able to say that it is uh, through the manifold grace and wisdom of God Display in the church that is according to the eternal purpose that he has purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Because all of uh, this wonderful thing where people of different ethnicities and classes and genders and who have every reason to not like one another are reconciled in one body through what God has done in Jesus. That what the world uh, would try to offer in a faux, fake, presumptuous way about unity and things uh, with violence or by the sword or through economic uh, exploitation, uh, that's not real unity. That's not really what it's after. It's that self-sacrificial uh, work of Jesus that allows for a true reconciliation, that allows for people to truly come together and allows for uh, people to put aside their differences and to work together in harmony because everything that would divide them has lost its power because Jesus has triumphed over those powers. And that's another important aspect of why Jesus died to overcome the powers and principalities and to, be, uh, to, to triumph over them as a victor in Colossians 2 and verse 15. These are the forces that have enslaved mankind from the beginning. Uh, yes, Satan is their great leader, uh, but they have worked well and in, in all they do. And they're still working well, dividing humans and enslaving people to do their will. But Jesus has triumphed over them because they did everything they could and threw all the evil they could at him. And he endured it all without responding in kind. He overcame the violence and overcame evil by doing good and by uh, participating in creative nonviolent acts in order to uh, expose the hypocrisy and the ugliness of the ways of the powers and principalities in the world and to point a different way uh, where those things are endured without responding in kind where enemies are loved and per and uh, those who persecute you are prayed for and that we ask for forgiveness for those who would do us harm it's a completely different way of living looking at the world turn everything upside down and when practice continues to turn the world upside down and it's the only thing that has truly allowed all people to stand equally before God. It didn't matter if you were Jewish or Gentile or male or female or upper class or lower class. All have sinned. All are in need of that cleansing from Jesus' blood. Only can obtain that victory through Jesus and what he has accomplished on the cross. So yes, Jesus is God. He is the son of David, the king of the Jews, the Messiah, the Holy One of God that the disciples were expecting. His death was not an accident or a mistake. It was part of the plan because Jesus is the Lamb of God, the sinless one, was able to atone for the sin of all people through his blood. And that is what allows him in his resurrection ascension to establish this kingdom and to proclaim what he has done and the forgiveness of sins, but first to Israel and then to all those of the nations and to create that space in the kingdom where all could be reconciled to one another and to stand as equals before Jesus and to affirm one another's humanity and value before God and to, to celebrate all that God has accomplished in Christ. And all of this was based on stuff we could not do for ourselves that we were lost in sin, and the only way we were going to be saved is through the rescue that God has accomplished for us in Jesus. And that is why it comes to us to hear what God has done in Christ, and therefore to accept it, to turn away from the ways that we've lived in the world, turn toward God in Christ, put our trust in Jesus as the Son of God, as the Christ, the King that God has sent to the world, who now reigns as Lord, and that we submit ourselves so that we follow him in his life and ways, that if we want to be uh, able to share in a life like his in the resurrection, that we have participated in his death through uh, believing, repenting, confessing, and being immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the of our sins, through living as a Christian and being willing to suffer as Jesus suffered, that we would be glorified with Jesus, to take our cross and follow after him, if that involves various forms of harassment, persecution, suffering, difficulty, and distress, that God will be glorified and that we would live as Jesus and people would see Jesus in us. And that is why it's so important for us to follow and serve Jesus, that we may be glorified with him, provided we suffer with him, and thus make good on all that he has done for us.
Let us go to God in prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. We're so thankful, Father, for everything that you've done for us. We understand that on our own, Father, we have sinned and fallen short of your glory, and you would have been the right to forget about us and to have nothing to do with us and to forsake us. But you have loved us and cared for us, and you have sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins, and that we have the forgiveness of sins through him if we would put our trust in him uh, and, and to glorify you. We are so thankful for that opportunity, and we pray that you would uh, forgive us of our sins in Jesus' blood, and that we would... Um, do all things to glorify you and him. And we're thankful for the Spirit and the Word for one another, for all the blessings that you've given us. We pray, Father, for those who are ill, that you would heal them. We pray that you would uh, protect those who are in distress and in harm and, and comfort them, that you would uh, comfort those who are grieving and in need, that you provide for them, uh, that you would protect and preserve life wherever it is in danger, and that you would uh, have your justice rise flow in our land, and that any of the designs of the powers and principalities against us will be thwarted in the name of Jesus. Uh, we pray, Father, to always uh, cling, cling close to all that you have done in Jesus, that we would follow after him, take up our cross, and to suffer with him, that we would be glorified with him, and that you would strengthen and sustain us through all of that, and that we would always be thankful for what you have done for us, and to realize that we could never do it on our own, and that we are dependent upon you for that salvation, and to depend upon you for all things, and to cease trusting in ourselves. Continue to guide and direct us in your ways until the Lord Jesus returns, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you've joined us. Love to hear your thoughts about why Jesus died. Why is it so important that he died and the way that he died and for what purpose? And what does that mean for you? Um, if you have any questions or comments, like to talk more about these things, please reach out to us in the comments. Subscribe to us where you found us or find us at VenusChurchChrist.org or also on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We look forward to encouraging you again soon. May the Lord bless and keep you until we're able to meet again.